we are back with our third session and we are going to be looking at topic 263 we are going to be highly we have called it the lord's supper remember we are looking at the 50 important topics in the word of god uh let's start with prayer i don't see people but yes you are coming on i hope you have grabbed your coffee I hope you are warm. <laughs> it's a little bit cold this side, but I hope you are warm. Father, we thank you. We bless you for this time you have given us. Come and speak to us, Holy Spirit. Come and teach us. Come and give us also the desire for your word. Come and give us the awesome desire and thirst for your word, mighty Lord. We are here and we invite you, Spirit of God, to come and speak through me. Come and build us, come and encourage us. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. It has been a minute. <laughs> okay, so this is our third session. We are going to be looking at the Lord's Supper. But remember, we are looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the whole chapter. We have tried to unwrap it, break it down. So when you see the topic, the Lord's Supper, uh, I know it's very famous with 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But 1 Corinthians chapter 11 doesn't only handle the Lord's Supper. It handles so many other things. But because that is one of the main gifts that are well taught, about in first corinthians chapter 11 um that's why it is called the lord's supper so we do have a couple of things that we are going to break down and you know look at when it comes to first corinthians chapter 11 remember we are looking at the important chapters in the bible so when you see us bringing first corinthians chapter 11 and then i've just done james chapter 3 we are looking at those very important chapters in the word of god it doesn't mean the other chapters are not important but as a bible school student these are chapters that you really 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 need to be grounded in when it comes to having knowledge in and around the word of god so when we look at first corinthians chapter 11 verse 1 is highly talking and here we can see paul saying that follow me even as I follow Christ. That is something, it is a statement on its own. I don't know if you can also say that as a child of God right now watching me. Can you tell someone else? I don't know anyone boldly like Paul said it. Follow me as I follow Christ. I feel this is one of those statements that are really, really, really bold. And we have to be able to be challenged by Paul to be able to tell people, follow me as I follow Christ. Is it a statement that you as a child of God or even a Bible school student right now, you can say to someone, follow me even as I follow Christ. You know, I remember seeing this scripture when I'd just given my life to Christ. I was so scared. I, you know, I thought, goodness me, I might lead someone. I, I don't know. Because if I tell someone, follow me as I follow Christ, I was still, and I'm still up to today we are still being perfected in christ and we are still finding our way and growing in christ to maturity but you know honestly can you tell someone okay maybe the new believer or anyone that you are discipling right now can you really tell them follow me even as i follow christ as paul says it i think that is very bold and we have to get to a place whereby we can literally our whole life can be in the light and should not be hidden that I can say to someone, follow me, even as I follow Christ. So such a powerful statement that Paul starts with in verse 1. Can you make that statement? That's the question that has been posed to you. You should be able to. Do you know where you are going? So that is one thing. If you're going to tell someone, follow me as I follow Christ, do you even know where you are going? <laughs> that is a question you want to ask yourself. Do, before I tell someone to follow me, imagine I tell someone right now, I, the easiest, let me talk about my kids. I tell them, you know what, guys, just follow me. The first thing the kids are going to ask me, where are you going? <laughs> and you know, kids of today, you can't just tell them to follow you. <laughs> they are going to be asking you a hundred questions just because you have just said something like, follow me. Okay, just follow me. They're like, where are you going? What are you going to be doing? And it's so important. <laughs> I did this, I remember one time, and they were asking so many questions because I wanted to surprise them. But then I looked at them and said to them, you think I can, you know, I can take you to, I don't know, to the worst place ever. <laughs> the reason why I've said follow me is because it's, it's a good thing. I'm taking you to a nice thing. You, you're going to enjoy it. I believe you're going, it's going to be an awesome surprise. But you know, 
the question that you need to ask yourself, where am I going? If I'm going to tell someone to follow me, me, the person who is leading them, where am I going? Okay, so God wants a heart after him. Do you have a heart after God? Because if you really, really are saying, I want someone else to follow me, even as I follow Christ, which should be a desire as a student watching me right now, or as a child of God watching me right now, it should be our desire, you know, that people should look at us and will desire the God that we have, will desire the love of God that we have. They will desire what we have. But it's so important to know that it has to start from a place whereby you have a heart after God. So Acts chapter 13 verse 22 says, And when he had removed him, he raised him unto them, David, them david to be their king to whom also he gave their testimony and said i have found david the son of jesse a man after my own heart which shall fulfill all my will so we can see here easily that if god himself says that david is a man after his heart god was able to trust david can god look at us and and look at us and say this is a daughter is my daughter because she she's after my heart we have to be people who can pursue the heart of god daily not that we are already there but daily desiring to be perfected in christ with a heart after god you can tell people to imitate you okay there might be some uh, detours, but you will get to the destination. If you have the heart after God and you desire to have the heart after God, let me tell you something. You can then tell people to follow you as you follow Christ. Yes, there will be some hiccups here and there, but let me tell you something. You will get to the destination. You will really get to the destination. And whether you like it or not, this is a statement that some of us might be saying, you know what, it's not the kind of statement. Maybe it's, it's being so proudful, like Paul at that time writes it. It is not really a proudful kind of statement, but it's one of those statements, whether you like it or not, as long as you are any human being, you will have people following you. Okay, whether you are... A child of God, whether you are not a child of God, you always have people following you. Now, if you are a child of God, you have to take them to the right destination. And you have to desire to have the heart that follows after him, who is Christ our Lord. We have to desire after his heart. We have to ask him and cry out and, you know, so that we can have the right intentions. And eventually we are going to get to the right destination. So when we look at now verse 2 to verse 16, remember we are in First Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 2 now. This is the second breakdown from verse 2 to verse 16. We can see the head. We can see there it's being talked about the head, meaning headship and authority in verse 2. Some points that are to be considered when we talk about the head. Number one, if you look at culture and tradition, already we can see Jews are already breaking the rule of covering their heads. These are some of the things that we have seen over and over that have been brought up. In so many discussions, believe me, I'm not going to go into those cultural discussions, but these are things that have been brought up about what about the covering of, of head for the, for the women and you know what, all these <laughs> cultural things that we are brought about. But if you look right now at the Jews already, this law is being broken. They are really not covering their heads. First Corinthians chapter 11 verse 7, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head. For, uh, for much as he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. And uh, as we are talking about the scriptures, this was something that is actually more culture that was being handled by Paul. And we don't want to go too much into it, but I'm going to bring a bit of pointers. Women originally from, from were originally from man. And remember how Eve came to be. Eve came from Adam. But now man actually comes from woman through a natural birth. It is not a spiritual thing, but women right now are the one who nurture and bring forth a child. And we can see here that they also bring both men. Okay, but they give back to men. Originally, a woman came from Adam. 
and that was Eve. But we can see later God gives a woman to be able to be the one to bring birth. And we can see how a woman gives natural birth to even a man, of course, and a woman too. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 11. Um, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. Both are as important before the Lord. And so many times we have heard this. And as I said earlier, I don't want to get into so many cultural logistics that Paul was trying to handle at that particular time in the church of Corinth. But I also believe in our own cultural settings we have these kind of challenges but it's so important to understand that before god <clears throat> when we look at verse 11 it says nevertheless neither is the man without the woman neither the woman without a man in the lord so both are equally important before the lord the angel and glory also need further clarity as scholars interpret them differently. Not in all cultures do women have long hair. You know, we saw that scripture that talks about women must not shave their heads or must cover their heads. But remember again, I'm coming back to culture. These specific verses were really more about culture and what Paul was trying to handle uh, in, the, in the church of Corinth. So not all cultures actually have long hair. This presents another interesting problem that we have seen so many times. I remember at one particular time, I was ministering. I went to minister and uh, <laughs> shockingly, it was just shockingly. So shockingly at the end of the whole, you know, um, uh, the service is done, everything is done. And uh, a gentleman comes to me. He wasn't rude. He wasn't rude at s whatsoever. He was not rude at all. So I can't even say that he was rude. But then he was asking me about um, and telling me that isn't it scripture that women are not are supposed to sit down. Okay. <laughs> women are supposed to sit down. And, you know, I, I, I handled it also gently. And I was able to bring a little bit of culture things that were happening at the time of Corinth. I mean, he quoted the scripture in Corinthians and I just handled a little bit of it. And I was able to refer this gentleman to the pastor, to the senior pastor at that time who had invited me. And we find that so many times these um, myths and um, what should I call it are still there are still there and and coming from a place i don't know and i i don't want to get too much in this but coming from a place of a woman i have faced this so many times i have faced this so many times as a woman i've faced it in so many areas i'm talking about ministry whereby you have had people fully resisting what god has given you to deliver because you're a woman okay fully resisting it i've had people when invited thinking that it's going to be my husband who is going to be ministering and it's me standing up there and literally i've had <laughs> being asked do you like don't you want to sit down <laughs> so I've, I've had the i don't know <laughs> i've had the uh, how should I call it? I've had it all. I've, <laughs> I've had, and uh, I think for me, I would like to say I've, I've, it has humbled me. I've gotten so humbled because at the end of the day, at one time when I was younger in ministry, I'm not that old in ministry, but yes, when I was way younger in ministry, at a particular time, I got so offended and I was telling God that, uh, you know what, uh, maybe we need to sit, maybe a woman is not supposed to. And I believe that scripture until the Holy Spirit revealed to me what it really meant. And the Holy Spirit, has, uh, the Holy Spirit told me, I, I choose who I choose. And, and, and I look at a willing heart and I use a willing heart. I, I look at your heart, I, lose a, I use a willing spirit. And my daughter, you are willing. So allow me to use you but it, it has not been easy and i'm saying even up to today it's not easy there are some places that you will not transcend in as a woman because you are looked under you are seen you're a woman you know but every time it happens inside me i just become so humble and i just say you know what it is well you know the lord i will i will deliver what the lord has given me 
and it's not about the vessel. It's really not about me, but it's really what the Lord has given. And eventually, the people who are resistance and all that are able to receive the word of God. But you know, at the end of the day, when we look at these scriptures here, if you are not to be able to be focused and to understand the revelation, I don't know if there are women who are uh, watching me right now, and I'm saying the Bible school students who are watching me right now, I want to encourage you. No, these uh, verses are highly used in the area of women not being able, you know, and uh, sit down. You, you, not, you are not gifted, you are not called, but God has called us. And when you look at this scripture here, it talks about equally they are called. The woman needs the man and the man needs the woman. So equally both are called and you have to understand who has called you. You have to understand who has called you and go ahead and serve the one who has called you. Because just the culture itself, apart from the Jews and what was happening then, but so many cultures in our system, so many cultures can make a woman shut up. They can tell you to shut up, sit down. And let me tell you something. I've gotten to a place whereby, yes, I've kept behind because of this. I'm so sorry I've taken so much time on that, but I really believe that it's so important, the women who are watching me right now. Please do not be offended, the gentlemen who are watching me right now, but I'm talking about, I want to speak to the women who are watching me right now, but I want to say to you, you are called by God. You are gifted by God, and God is the one who has called you, and God is saying to you, my daughter, stand up and serve, you know, and yes, there will be boundaries, there will be cultural boundaries, there will be so many things that will come your way, which I also believe there are so many things that come to even the gentlemen, but to the woman, it's another thing. You you have to stand up and serve the Lord. That day when we go before the Lord, you are not going to use the excuse of a woman. We have seen so many in history. We have seen so many revivals started and run by women. Catherine Kruman, so many women out there, even right now in our generations, have succeeded. They have passed through all the cultural boundaries, even in business, even in so many things, but have allowed themselves, you know what, to go out there and do mighty and great things. And if you're a woman right now and you are sitting down and you are saying, I'm a woman, I will not be able to serve God. I am not called. I am not gifted because I'm a woman. I want to say to you, remove anything that the enemy is trying to restrain you to serve God. Because when you stand before God, I'm telling you something, you are not going to have any excuse. He is going to ask you because he has called you. He has not called everyone. He has called you. So a woman out there, regardless of your age, regardless of your color, regardless of what society has labeled you, it's time for you to get up, serve the Lord, and be bold to serve him. Only him is the one who has called you. Serve him. But remember, in humbleness and in harmony, our gifts are supposed to work together in the body. All right. Let me leave that point. <laughs> let me go on. All right. So when we look at some other verses, there's some verses that please Bible school students would like you to go and read the Message Bible. Message Bible is going to give you such an awesome translation when it comes to verse 2 to verse 16, okay, of First Corinthians chapter 11. It's going to give you such an awesome translation in the things that I was talking about. When we talk, we represent authority. You know, we do not want to show disrespect for those under whose authority we are. This should not be a major issue or a point of contention. So even though you are a woman or a male or whatever you are, still you have to understand that you have to respect authority and you have to speak and understand that there is authority, there is order, and God works in order. Then we can go to verse 17 until verse 34, the famous verses, the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. And I know in the mornings we always do Holy Communion. So believe me, this is a very famous one. When we look at this, we can see Paul looking 
at conduct of people at the mill. When this came around, Paul was really handling a lot of things that were happening in the Corinth, um, in the Corinthian church. And one of them was the Lord's Supper and how it was mishandled and so many things that were happening at that particular time. Now, reference verse Romans chapter 14, verse 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. First John chapter 2, verse 10. We can see Paul here dealing with conduct when it came to the area of a meal. We have not to be a stumbling block to others. So we have to kind of be, be um, um, what is the right English word? We have to be to be in a place whereby we can think about others and not be selfish about ourselves. There are some things that we can read the word of God that says they are good, okay? But are all things beneficial? The word of God says they are good, but are all things beneficial? And you have to get to a place whereby you ask yourself, they are good, but are they beneficial? But also are they a stumbling block to my brother, to my lesser brother, and I will bring this, and I really bring this one because this I struggled with when I was just uh, um, just giving my life to Christ. So giving my life to Christ, there were some things that I really used to struggle with. Coming from an area whereby alcohol and all these things were happening. Now, it, it looks like it might be off the topic, but I really want to talk about the topic of stumbling, uh, becoming a stumbling block for your younger brother in Christ or someone who is weaker in that area. You know, so I gave my life and one of the things that I ran away from that I'd seen around me was alcohol. I, I had I had originally grown up and grown up in a tavern, seen what this this thing can do to people. And one of the covenants that I met with I made with God, not only me actually, my husband, then also he wasn't yet my husband, was my friend, but one of the things that he had struggled with was alcohol. So when I gave my life to Christ, it is one thing that I, I would literally run away from. And um Go to a friend who was mature, way mature in Christ, older than me and my husband. And we, they had a mini bar. They, they're Christians. They had a mini bar. Now, I'm not condemning what they, whatever it is about alcohol. But, you know, I, we were still young in the Lord. And I struggled so much with this. <laughs> my husband also struggled, was then my friend. We struggled so much with this. And, you know, we had a talk with this gentleman. And we just uh, asked, you know, how can you as a Christian, how do you, you know, discussions that he can explain to us, you know, we know the scriptures. And, but, you know, and we said, you know, when we come to your place and we see this and we see you doing this, we kind of, feel like because it, it is like it's encouraging for us we might end up also in the same road but you know the person quickly just did this you know ugh, don't be too spiritual about it you know but at the end of the day he wasn't able to understand that at that particular time that was a stumbling block for us because we did i did explain to this person why we are asking about this specific thing because it's something that we struggled with when we we're in the world now to him it might not be something that can make him weaker i don't know i didn't live with him so i didn't know really if he gets drunk or he doesn't get drunk i've heard about so many things and i don't want to go into that logistic about alcohol but we have to be mindful about the other christians and the other people we can become a stumbling block for many others, we can really become a stumbling block. So when you see Paul handling the meal and talking about let us not be a stumbling block, it is so important that we have ears. We are sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And we are also sensitive to our brothers and sisters. 
you know, because the walk we are walking is not a selfish walk, you know. And we have to get to a place whereby we are sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We are sensitive when one of our brothers is a bit sensitive and, 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 and says something about a particular area. Be in a place whereby you can be sensitive. Because let me tell you something. You can become a stumbling block. And that would have encouraged me to also start drinking. I would have ended up, you know what I mean, backsliding. But I was able to actually go to someone else who gave me good guidance about this specific area. And it is something that I believe should, should be very important. Well, when you see Paul handling this very important area of stumbling block, it is very important for us to understand. So this, as we look at this, um, the Lord's Supper, it was the Passover meal that was being taken. Uh, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 8, as we know, it referred to the Passover meal. They shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall also eat it. Luke chapter 22 and verse 15. We can see that this was a reference of the Passover meal that we find in Exodus that Jesus was actually doing here and that Paul was talking about here. The Lord's Supper consists of these embryos. The first thing that we know the Lord's Supper consists of is bread. So as we all know, the bread is the body of Jesus. The bread represents the body of Jesus as Jesus spoke to them and said, this is my body that was laid down. We can see stripes upon his back for your death, for your health. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. So the moment you take the Lord's Supper, and you hold that bread, that is the body of Jesus Christ. And by his stripes, he was taken. He took it upon himself. And because of that, we, the Bible says, we are healed. Not we are going to be healed, but we are healed. We can see through the, uh, the bread also, you, it was, Jesus was bruised for our own iniquity. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Another element that we can see here is the cup, which represents the blood of of Jesus Christ. This dealt with sin. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law anymore, but under grace. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we are no longer under anymore the law. We have been forgiven, and no more shall sin have dominion over us. We are washed and cleansed. Sin has no more power over those who are dead, but alive unto Christ. We are now alive in Christ using the blood of Jesus Christ, which is represented by the cup. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Romans chapter 6, verse 6 to verse 8. We can see here also that sin has no more power over us who are alive in Christ. Before we were dead, but now we are alive in Christ. And it's because of the blood that was shed and that was given to break sin. And you know what is amazing? When this scripture says, I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. I don't know if we really understand the, the, uh, the, the, the weight of this scripture because this scripture has so much weight that it's no longer I who lives, the dead one, me who was dead. It's no longer I who lives, but Jesus has exchanged himself for my life and he has bought me now i it's no longer i who lives but christ lives in me you know and god ahead and says also the life which i now live in the flesh i live by faith 
of the Son of God. He has exchanged and he has given, laid his own life for me. And now my life has been saved and redeemed by him. No longer do I live dead anymore. I'm no longer dead, but I'm alive now in Christ Jesus. And it is not only that, something very amazing. I live now by faith through the Son of God. And that is the power of the cup the blood of Jesus Christ. We are living now by faith. We are no longer dead. We are so alive now. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6 to verse 8. It is so important to consider these things. You know, at one time, I don't know if we understand the real power that is actually in the, in the blood, in the blood of Jesus and what it represents. I, I find that so many times I, when you, unless you have the, the, what do I, the experience, not really the experience, the encounter in a specific scripture, you are able to understand. I, I knew that there is power in the blood of Jesus, you know, but I really got to understand the power that is in the blood of Jesus when I was sick in 2015. When I got so sick and uh, I wasn't getting better, my life was diminishing, you know, doctors were doing their best. <laughs> and I was asking the Lord, I was asking the Lord, Lord, I'm, I'm literally, I feel I'm getting finished day by day. We put out faith. I had a, a team praying. I had all the support that you can actually have in any, any situation as a child of God. I cannot even dispute that I didn't have support. I had all the support that you can have as a child of God. But I was just becoming worse. We did everything. Everything you can do. <laughs> okay. We believed. I, I questioned. I said, Lord, don't I have enough faith? Is something lacking? I know. And, and I said, no. <laughs> I believe. I believe. But you know what? Until I really experienced the power of the blood of Jesus, it was just knowledge. And I remember this particular day, I was very weak. I couldn't literally get out of bed. And I, 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 I just laid there in bed and I said, Lord, Jesus, let, let your blood heal me. Let your blood heal me. I am healed, you know. <laughs> I prophesied that I thanked him for the healing, but my physical body was really not receiving the healing. And I remember uh, the just, just something like it was a thought in my heart saying to me, Go and get the elements of Holy Communion and do Holy Communion every day. Do Holy Communion every day. And I'm like, wow. So you know what I did? I did Holy Communion every day. I didn't get better that specific day. I didn't get better the next day. But I am telling you something. I became well as time went on. It was a continual healing. And... The Holy Spirit, I, I dug in the Bible. I dug for every scripture that talks about the blood of Jesus. Every scripture that, I mean, I looked at, at 1 Corinthians and I looked at the Lord's Supper in a different way. I asked the Lord to give me such revelation. I got such, such revelation. You know, and at the end of that, almost at the end of my full healing, I had an encounter whereby I had two... I don't want to go into so much, but two demons came for me and it was a vision, but they came for me. They were wearing black. I couldn't see their face, but they came for me, but they posed as my friends. So in, in that vision, I was so happy. It looked so real. I was so happy that my friends had come. I walked with them. We went out. I was like, guys, I've been wanting to talk to you about what is going on. But I remember them taking me out of my house, my home, and we walked to the street together and when we got to the street they turned around and i got to realize okay so these are not my friends these are demons but i was only able to realize it later okay as i got out of the house they lowered me out of the house got outside and it looked real but it was a vision i got there and they turned around and i was held in between them and they started squeezing me now they looked at me with such such you know, I can't even explain the anger. Like, we have to take you out. Today's the day. 
I remember saying the name of Jesus. And I know some of you can, can testify about what I'm saying. I remember saying the name of Jesus, calling the name of Jesus. I'm telling you, nothing was happening. <laughs> I was feeling that I was going. I was going out. I was going like they were squeezing every life out of me as they were holding me. I remember going into tongues and speaking tongues. Nothing was happening. And just after that, I stopped. And inside me, I asked God, Holy Spirit, tell me, how do I escape? You know, because I've used everything. I mean, I spoke scriptures before. I spoke even the name of Jesus. And it came. It was a light. It just came to me, the blood of Jesus. And I'm telling you, the moment I said the blood of Jesus Christ, something like oil poured over me. It was like oil. It poured over me. I became slippery out of their hands. And I remember looking at these two demons. As I became slippery out of their hands, they were looking and they couldn't see me. I remember in that vision, I rest back. Literally, I didn't run, but I rest back. And I found my body on my bed. I found another corny on my bed. And I looked at that corny on my bed and I was like, whoa. And I entered that corny on my bed. I remember breathing in so heavily. Like, you know, breathing in like it was my first breath. And coming back. And going like I told my husband. I just had <laughs> such an attack. But I, every time I remember the power that is in the blood of Jesus. Now, I, I, I don't know those who are studying right now. But I was able to understand the encounter and the power. That is in the blood of Jesus. I continue to do Holy Communion. So when I see Dr. Arthur doing the morning Holy Communion at 9, I pray and I hope that we get to understand the power that is in that Holy Communion. Because let me tell you something. The blood of Jesus Christ is so, so powerful. And if we can understand that, if we can understand that, because sometimes we have the head knowledge, but we don't really have the revelation of something there's so much power in the lord's supper there's so much power in the blood of jesus and i want to say to you right now if you are feeling sick in your body i want you to reach out to that blood i want you to reach out to him he says by his stripes we were healed we are healed by his stripes let it move from just head knowledge to you know what saying to the lord lord give me revelation about who you are you know if you are not feeling well right now if you are struggling in any way there's so much power in this price and sacrifice that jesus christ has laid down for you and i you know i can't even sit there and, and think about what he had to go through so that he could save me so that he could be crucified for you know for me to be alive again so that to be crucified for me to be able to have healing in my body for me to be alive again from being dead in my sin but to have so much authority over darkness and to have so much authority over sin and it is available to you but are you able to know you know to take it and take authority over the enemy and say you know what jesus has paid it all so right now if you're sick i'm just bringing it in just believe it is possible he can heal you you don't have to do any works you just have to believe and if you are struggling with believing, because I did when I was so sick, because I became so sick for so long, I struggled with faith. And I literally had to ask God as I read his word, give me faith. You know, that gentleman who told to Jesus that, you know, um, son, Jesus, son of, 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 of David, you know, um, have mercy on me. You know, because this gentleman was struggling, was struggling, I believe, he was struggling with faith. He was struggling to believe, you know, that Jesus, the son of David, the son of David could really heal him. And let me tell you, if you are struggling with that, ask him. He is available. Ask him. As you read his word, ask him, Lord, awaken my faith. Awaken my faith so that I can take authority as a child of God. There's so much power in what Jesus did through the Lord's Supper. I hope we can fully understand it, even as Bible school student, you know, to be in a place where we can understand. So when we look also at this, some of the scriptures that I've really laid down is to understand that um, as confirmed, 
I read uh, um, the benefits of the cross. Okay, let me just look. Some points to consider when it comes to the Lord's Supper. Proclamation of the Lord's death, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. For as often as you shall eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death till he comes. So when the moment we are doing the, the Holy Communion, we are also being eager, we are waiting the coming of our Lord. We are doing it in remembrance, but also we are awaiting, we are eagerly awaiting the coming of our Lord and our Savior. We are not, it's not going to end here. We are destined and we are going somewhere. Every time we do that, the Lord's Supper, we come to the Lord's Supper and remember that we are also uh, making a statement that Lord we are waiting for you you are coming for us you must also examine yourself 2nd Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5 examine yourselves to see whether you are in faith test yourselves do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you unless of course you fail the test 2nd Corinthians 2 chapter 5 verse 17 examine yourself examining yourself is not an element of judgment so many people have talked about examining yourself is all about an element of judgment it is not an element of judgment at all it is not you judging yourself it is you examining your faith your faith in him your faith in this specific um um, sacrifice that Jesus laid down. It is you to examine how you are actually been living and if you have really, really taken on full faith for the work that he has already done. Do it also in remembrance of me. It is said there in the word of God. The price he has paid. Do it to remember the price that Jesus Christ has actually paid. Jesus Christ has paid the price. First Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20. For you are bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which is God's. You have been bought at a price. It is a price that no one can pay. No one can pay the price that Christ paid. You have been bought at such a high price and you ought to show forth by how you glorify God with your own body. The benefits that come through what he accomplished on the cross, there's so many benefits that we see that come through what he accomplished on the cross. It is also very important to understand that we ought to do this not in unworthy manner, when we are having Holy Communion, uh, has nothing to do with examining yourself. Unworthy manner is not about examining yourself. It is all about how you discern the body of Christ and what he did for you. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. The blood that Jesus poured 2,000 years ago is still active. And it is still fresh and it's still as powerful as it was poured 2,000 years ago, the blood Jesus power does not lost its power, child of God who is watching me. It will never lose its power. It has not lost its power. That same blood is as powerful and active as it was 2,000 years ago. His body is the bread of life and we have to consume everything. His whole body, we have to consume it. We can see Matthew chapter 26 and verse 26. We consume everything, not just a bit of it. We have to take the whole of Jesus. We don't pick up. We don't pick out the nice things about Jesus and about the gospel and about the word of God. It's all of him. And it is not a pretty thing and it's not an easy thing, but we consume everything as we saw also in Exodus. The Holy Spirit needs to reveal Jesus and the Father to us as they are so that we are able to consume everything it is so important to understand that we have to be obedient to the word of god as i finish be obedient to the word of god be obedient to the word of god every part of the word of god is important and when the word of god talks about whole, um, the lord's supper must be done occasionally more often 
It is us to obey that word. Father, we thank you for this time that you have given us. We bless you and we pray, Almighty Father. May you go ahead of us. May you guide us, but may you bring so much revelation. I pray for someone right now who is sick in their body right now. Someone who is struggling with faith, mighty Lord. That even as they read your word, as they watch this video, God, may you awaken heights of faith in them. May you awaken, oh God, faith in them, Almighty Father. I pray for everyone who is right now struggling with sickness we declare healing in the name of jesus we rebuke every sickness we rebuke every satanic attack over their lives over their families in the name of jesus and we declare right now that we have been bought by the blood of jesus and we are free we take authority in the name of jesus we speak healing we speak freedom we speak deliverance and we speak restoration through the blood that was shed by our lord jesus christ and we speak healing because of his body that he received stripes for we are healed receive that if you are not feeling well right now i don't know why i felt that in my spirit and i believe receive it because it is available for you you don't have to work for it you just have to receive his healing have a blessed week everyone and hope to see you next monday god bless you and stay blessed